All right, well, um, this session here is on mass timber construction. Um, so I'm going to be presenting first, then we have three other sessions after me. Each session is going to be about 15 minutes, so we should have about 20 minutes or so at the end for questions um, and discussion. So uh, my name is Ricky McLean. I'm with Woodworks. I'll explain a little bit more about myself in just a second. Um, and then presentations after that. Uh, really, the whole idea with this panel uh, of, of presentations is to, to introduce you all, if you're not familiar with what is mass timber, what's happening nationally, um, what's happening here in the region, and then to highlight three specific things, two local projects, one in Vermont using mass timber, one in New Hampshire using mass timber, and then also looking at the potential of using um, eastern hemlock as a local species in mass timber production. Um, so the, I've got, I guess a couple housekeeping things too. I think there's, there have been these sign-in sheets in all the other sessions. So if you need to sign in here, this particular session is also registered uh, with AIA. So if anybody's a registered architect or need AIA credits, there's a separate sign-in sheet up here. Um, so we, so there's, there's that available to you as well. We're required to show these because it's registered with AIA. <laughs> so, all right, here we go. <laughs> Um, so, as I mentioned, my name is Ricky McLean with Woodworks. Um, I'm a structural engineer by background. I've been with Woodworks for about eight years. Prior to that, worked for a consulting engineering firm in Montpelier. So I've lived in, I live here in Vermont, I live in Cabot, um, have lived here for about 15 years. And Woodworks is a national nonprofit that provides free project support design assistance. Essentially, our role is to be a free resource to those who are designing and building any types of, of commercial or multifamily projects. So we essentially help uh, architects, structural engineers, building developers, contractors uh, on projects that they're working on. We work throughout the entire country and we're free. We're funded by um, organizations like the USDA Forest Service, Softwood Lumber Board, as well as a number of actual wood products manufacturers. Kind of the idea is uh, we're able to help those people that are designing and building wood buildings do it more efficiently do it so that it's less barrier to them and then in return it's easier for them to do so they continue to do those types of projects in the future more wood gets used in commercial and multifamily construction so that's essentially what we do um, and these are I mentioned our funding partners so my session here is really going to give you a glimpse because I do and Woodworks does work on projects throughout the country kind of take a step back the 30,000 foot view what's going on across the US with mass timber construction and then we'll start to hone in a little bit more specifically here in the Northeast to give you an idea of what's going on. I'm just curious though, before we, we start, these are some mass timber products. Mass timber is really an umbrella term that encompasses a number of different products. Just by show of hands, who is familiar with what, what mass timber is? Pretty familiar with what mass timber is. Okay, so most people are. That's good. So as I mentioned, it's really an umbrella term that encompasses a number of products. And kind of the common theme here is that there are large cross sections of wood, but they're composed of a number of smaller individual pieces of wood. So you can kind of draw some similarities to heavy, heavy timber style of construction, which right after this, when you go back out to the exhibit or the expo area, you see a lot of that, what I would call heavy timber construction. There's large cross sections of wood, but each of those is one, came from one singular tree or one singular log. So the old adage there was large column, large tree. Right. In order to make those large cross sections of wood, you had to have a large, in some cases, old growth tree. So with mass timber, you're still creating these large cross sections of wood, but instead of a single 10 by 10 uh, column, it may be 10 1 by 10 boards that are glued together, nailed together, screwed together, etc. So you're creating these large cross sections of wood, get a lot of the same attributes as heavy timber in terms of the aesthetic benefits, fire resistant capabilities, um, structural capabilities but you're utilizing maybe some of the lower grade lumber or less commonly used uh, softwood species. You don't have to utilize the old growth lumber. You're using small diameter trees in some cases. It's also an engineered wood product, meaning you can vary where within the depth of a beam or a panel different uh, grades of wood are based on where the structural stresses are highest. And kind of the analogy you know, to me as an engineer, what I think of is you've probably all seen a steel what we call it a wide flange beam or an eye shape, right? Where there's a flange, a web, and a flange. The whole idea with something like that is it's, it's when that, that beam goes into bending, all of the structural stresses are at the very top and the very bottom of that beam. 
in the middle, the structural stresses are fairly low. So for something like a cross laminated timber panel, it's very similar. This, this is basically replacing a concrete slab. So when you're walking across that, it's gonna make that start to bend. So very similarly, the, all of the structural stresses are concentrated at the top and at the bottom. So let's utilize higher strength lumber at the top and the bottom and utilize lower grade wood in, in the middle portions of that panel. So it's, it's again, it's an engineered product, so it's more able to optimize, use more efficient uh, use of the particular wood species and grades. So cross laminated timber, glue laminated timber, uh, nail laminated timber, dowel laminated timber, these are all different products within mass timber. But again, the common theme is smaller dimensional wood products somehow combined together to create larger cross sections. And as I mentioned, at the end, we will have plenty of time for questions, but if anybody does have questions throughout, don't hesitate to, to stop any of us. This is a map on, on our website where we're keeping track of all of the mass timber projects that we're aware of uh, for several reasons, but one of which is to try to track the growth of the industry as a whole. Um, we started tracking these project numbers in 2013, 2014 was really one of the kind of the first significant uses of mass timber in the US. And at that time, there was about 20 projects, 20 mass timber projects across the entire US. So now, you know, these, these are just a couple months old, we're nearing 1400 projects. Um, so the numbers are pretty significantly growing. Now, if you kind of look at that in context of construction in the US in general, year over year, there's about 17,000 building projects done in the US. So it's a, it's a small drop in that bucket, but if you consider 20 projects, you know, eight, nine years ago to 1,400 projects now, you can start to see it is a very significant growth. And I've got kind of that growth rate that I'll show you here in just a second. Um, it's about half and half too, so we are tracking both projects that are built as well as projects that are in design, because those, again, those projects that are in design are ones that we're helping those project teams with. And then to focus here in New England, um, the numbers are, are growing quite a bit. You can see here about 80 projects that are currently in design, just in New England, and then 50 mass timber projects that are completed. And I'll show a few examples of those here in a second. This is that growth rate that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So this chart here is showing a year, you know, so on the far left starting in the early 2000s. And then I mentioned, you know, really started to kind of take that uptick, 2014, 2013. But ever since, you know, in the past five years or so, it's seen that significant growth. This is just looking at the number of projects uh, per year. Uh, coincidentally, the average size of mass timber projects has also pretty significantly grown year over year as more mass timber gets used. And then just showing kind of where those are filling out. You can see quite a bit of interest and in use in the Northeast. The Pacific Northwest has kind of historically been a heavy concentration of timber use, uh, understandably so, uh, but the Northeast is, is has seen and is continuing to see a steady interest in use of mass timber products. All right, so for those who are not familiar with, with the building code side of things, I do mention it just because of the fact that it does drive a lot of the use or lack of use of mass timber in commercial and multifamily projects uh, because of limitations on where and how large of buildings it allows mass timber to be used in. Um, but this here is just showing you that it's, it's updated. The, so this is the International Building Code. It's kind of the basis that each individual state adopts. It's updated every three years. And just starting with the 2015 version and then significant updates again in the 2021 version, there have been um, big advancements in terms of how the building code recognizes mass timber. We'll explain those as we go through. So up to a couple of years ago, most mass timber projects in the U.S. were you know, looked very, not similar in terms of the, how they look aesthetically, but looked similar in terms of scale and use. Um, a lot of the times it was either office, institutional, higher ed, um, and three, four, five stories it was a very common application for mass timber, which I think makes a lot of sense because if you think about mass timber's use, it's, it's traditionally not meant to be a replacement for a light wood frame building, you know, where we can build uh, a three or four story apartment building out of light wood frame construction. Mass timber was never necessarily intended to be a replacement for that. It was meant to be a replacement for more carbon intensive materials like steel and concrete. And so steel and concrete materials are very common in, in these types of projects. But as I'll show here in a minute, we're starting to see more mass timber use in the housing sector and multifamily sectors as well. 
So based on previous versions of the building code, and, and by the way, this is also the version that the state of Vermont is currently based on, these were kind of the limits in terms of how tall of a building you could do, four or five stories using mass timber. And that was the same as, as what you could do with light wood frame construction. The building code didn't make a recognition of the differences between light wood frame construction and mass timber construction. So they were both kind of capped at these same limits. Now, just to maybe take a little bit of a deeper dive and also show you a few local projects that have used mass timber. Um, again, this is kind of that open floor plate beam and column system with mass timber, um, not using bearing walls like we would have in a building like this, but more of an open office building, higher education, for example. Uh, this was one of the first kind of early adopting projects of mass timber on a taller scale. This is a seven story office building in Minneapolis called T3. Uh, the developer for this project is Heinz. They're a large global developer. Um, and they've since taken, so T3 stands for Timber Transit Technology. And the whole idea with these projects, they've replicated this. Uh, there's a T, this is T3 Minneapolis. There's now a T3 complete in Atlanta. There's one under construction in Denver. They have several under construction in Canada. So their whole idea with this is to put projects, timber projects, in, in downtown hubs um, near transit centers, um, and then the technology piece is bringing in, like for example, Amazon leases, I believe, several floors of this building. So really trying to attract young talent to these, these buildings and give them a workplace to work in that is much different than really any other office building in the city that they're constructed in. So that's kind of the idea behind this, this project. And you can see here, this is an interior shot of this T3 office building. So really a very different but beautiful office building compared to what most people work in. They do not have uh, steel superstructures? That's correct. So this project here has, you can't see it here, um, the only, well, the first floor is actually all concrete because it's a parking garage. And then six stories of office space above. Um, it's all timber construction for those six stories with the exception that the elevator and stair cores are concrete. But there's no there's no structural significant structural steel throughout. It's all so you can kind of see like these are the tim, the blue lamb beams, the blue lamb columns, and then this here is an NLT nail laminated timber panel. Uh, so that's about 20 feet between each of those beams, and that timber panel just spans between. <clears throat> yep. Much much uh, more local here to where we are. This is a project at the University of Massachusetts Amherst called the John Oliver Design Building. Um, and maybe just to give you, oops, I guess that's the only slide on that one. Just to give you a, a kind of a short personal story on this project. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I've been with Woodworks for about eight years, um, but, and I had visited several mass timber buildings, smaller scale. When I went down to visit this project, I believe it was 2017 or 2018, to me personally, this was an eye opener. Um, I think this is a really, it's a four story, about 90,000 square foot project large scale, really beautiful, also a number of, of innovative uses of mass timber. It's not just like we saw in the previous slide, beams and columns and slabs, it is that, but it's, um, there's this really beautiful um, mass timber open stair that goes up to the second story. When you walk in, there's this about 80 foot wide by 100 foot long courtyard. Um, there's CLT for the elevator and, and core walls, kind of you know, in lieu of the concrete that I mentioned on the previous project. Timber braced frames. Um, you can, I just can't quite see them here, but in some of the facades, you can see these interior diagonal timber braced frames. So, anyways, I mentioned that because I would also encourage you, if you are interested in seeing a mass timber building, this is obviously a, it's a public project, um, and I know some of the faculty there is is very open to kind of taking people through the building. So, if you're interested in that, I would you, encourage you to do that. Uh, this is a project done by an architect in Connecticut um, called Common Ground High School and a number of different uh, applications of mass timber. I know Bensonwood, one of our future speakers, is, was involved in this project. Um, this is an interesting one here. This is the uh, jet port in Portland, Maine. Uh, if anybody's ever flown in or out of Portland, Maine, there's, uh, you can see here, these, so these are steel columns and then kind of like the four branches atop that, but everything above that point is all what we would consider mass timber construction. This project's been around for, for several years. This is an office building, three-story office building in Newington, New Hampshire. It's right outside of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, kind of in an industrial park um, where you can see like this, this building behind it. Reminds me, this area reminds me a lot of the industrial parks if you've been to them in Williston, where there's a lot of kind of that low-rise office construction. 
Uh, but again, the developer on this project saw the potential of using mass timber as a way to attract talent uh, workers to this building, which is in a setting where it's kind of you know the typical office building over and over, but a very different interior aesthetic. So that was one of the benefits that the developer saw in this project. Mass Timber is actually seeing a pretty significant resurgence in New York City right now. The building code in New York City has historically been fairly restrictive on how it, how it allows the use of wood, um, and particularly mass timber. That has recently changed, um, and several projects actually happened prior to that change, and we're going to start to see quite a bit more because of the change as well, I believe. Uh, but this was a two buildings side by side. This is the five-story building here. This, these are both in Brooklyn. And then there's a three-story building right next door, a mix of office and multifamily space. We're also seeing mass timber used in what we call hybrid styles of construction, where it's you know, to your question earlier about integrating steel, I showed the one project that had concrete cores. We're seeing that you know, many design, designers really understand that it's, it doesn't have to all be mass timber. And that's not, I'm not up here to tell you that if you're gonna do a mass timber building, it all has to be mass timber. It's really what materials work best and fit best. So these are just some examples. This is um, a residence hall at the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island, where you can see here, these are all steel, structural steel beams but supporting CLT floor panels. And then the project on the left is, is actually Adidas' new headquarters facility in Portland, Oregon, where they're using concrete, precast concrete columns, precast concrete beams, and then these are glue lamp purlins here, and then in between those is CLT panels. So it's really using what materials maybe are least expensive in the region that you're building in and work best for the required spans or layout of the project. There's, there's been, I believe, five constructed, several under still in planning uh, in Massachusetts, these small regional airports. This is the one in Beverly. Uh, but they're also using that similar style of hybrid construction, where you can see it's a mix, you know, structural steel columns and, and glue lamb CLT for the roof as well. And this is something where I, I mentioned a, a while ago that we're starting to see more mass timber used in multifamily. And this is one of those applications where I'm, I'm honestly not sure about this particular project, this building that we're standing in. I know it's not mass timber, um, but this scale of project could have been done with light wood frame construction, where it would be light wood frame walls, and then the, the floor would usually be trusses or wood eye joists, something like that. That may be what this building is, I'm just not sure. Um, or maybe steel. But regardless, the idea is kind of taking that style of project, that scale of project, still use wood for the vertical systems, the walls, but then replace that floor assembly with a mass timber assembly. So the benefit is it's exposed on the ceiling side. So that's the finished surface instead of looking up you know, at this. Uh, that's the finished exposed surface. And, but you still get the benefits of you know, the wall systems. Obviously, we have to run electrical, plumbing, those types of things. So we can use those wall systems, which we're very familiar with in this type of construction, but get the benefits of mass timber for the ceiling. So several projects across the country that have used that approach. This is a, a project right near the Denver Broncos Stadium uh, called Cirrus. It's actually a seven-story building, five stories of this hybrid style, mass timber floors, light frame walls, over two stories of concrete construction. The main reason for that is that the code caps you at five stories of wood. So you can do that over multiple stories of concrete, but you couldn't do all seven stories of wood just yet. Yes? Are they uh, walls structural in that case? Are they holding up the CLT? They are bearing walls, yep, yeah. exactly. And yeah. do, are they getting the benefit that we hear about of uh, the time reduction in construction by using CLT versus a truss type of floor in those applications? Yeah, exactly. So what you're generally doing is, I'm not sure if these particular walls were, but generally what you're wanting to do if you use this hybrid style is panelize the walls off-site. So a contractor, whether it's you know, the general contractor for the project, the framing contractor, or a specialty subcontractor, will panelize those walls off-site, you know, eight or 10 foot long sections. Bring those to site so those go up very quickly so that they can match the speed of the CLT install. I haven't really gotten into the benefits of, of you know, why mass timber. One of those is speed of construction. You know, these panels are generally eight to 10 feet wide, 40, 50 feet long and each panel takes 15 minutes or so to install. So you're installing 500 square feet of panel, you know, on a large scale anyways, um, quite quickly. So yes, to your point, you're definitely wanting to, to 
you're able to generate speed of construction with the panels, but you're also wanting to keep up with the vertical systems too. Uh, another similar style of, of hybrid construction, this is a senior assisted living facility in Portland, Oregon. Um, another one in Oakland, California. You can see here one of the, one of the reasons that Mass Timber works so well on this project is, is the incredibly tight site. You can see there's you know, a street here, a street here, elevated freeway here, um, and they have a, basically about a zero foot setback on those three sides. So using Mass Timber allowed them to get on the site and get off the site very quickly. 23 working days, this building went from slab on grade to, to not a finished building, but fully framed in building. So a very quick install period. And then interestingly, a project much closer to home, an interesting application of this type of hybrid style of construction. Uh, this is a, another senior or assisted living facility in Portland, Maine, but the application of CLT here was simply for the shaft wall construction. You've probably all seen if you drive around and see a, a, like a light wood frame apartment building under construction, most often what you'll see is that the masonry shaft walls go up first. They go up all the way, right? And then the wood frame is done around it. From a code perspective, there's no reason that those have to be masonry. There's no reason they have to be non-combustible materials at all. Kind of the, the rule of thumb is that if the rest of the building can be framed with wood, the code allows you to fr frame those shaft walls with wood. But it's kind of become the norm here, so people will just generally do that. But projects like this, I think, are really opening some eyes. So they use CLT only for the shaft walls on this project. They're not using it for the floor panels. But they were installing each of these shafts in, in about a half a day, as opposed to a four-story tall masonry shaft. You know, it might take several weeks just because of the, the period of time it takes. Not to mention, you've introduced two trades, you know, the, the masons and the framers. With this, it was all done by the framers. So it certainly speeds construction, simplifies the job site. All right, and then just a couple of my uh, last few slides here is that I kind of alluded at the very beginning that building codes have been one of the restricting things with mass timber in terms of seeing its growth, uh, but that's significantly been changed in the 2021 version, the current version of the building code, which from what I understand, the state of Vermont is going to be adopting in uh, November of this year. So what has changed is that instead of that five to six story cap that I mentioned, mass timber can now be built up to 18 stories. Um, varying, so there's three new construction types, that's why it shows three different building scales. And with the different scales of building, essentially the difference is how much timber can be left exposed to the interior of the building. Um, but several projects that kind of fed into these code changes, this is an eight story building in Portland, Oregon called Carbon 12. Um, and then this project here um, is, is under construction now, it's called Ascent in Milwaukee. And when it's complete, which it should be about by a couple months from now, um, it's gonna be the tallest timber building in the world. Uh, it's 25 stories, about 280 feet. The top 19 stories, so from here up, are all mass timber construction, with the exception of the cores, again, concrete cores, um, and then six stories of concrete construction at the base, primarily parking there. Um, and just a kind of a personal side note, as I was listening to the folks from GoLab um, talked this morning. It reminded me a couple months ago at the Mass Timber Conference in Portland, Oregon, we had a talk with Tim Gockman, who's the developer on this project. They're a, a Milwaukee-based developer. And Tim and his father, Boris Gockman, um, talked through the process of financing, you know, the, the world's tallest Mass Timber building. Um, starking similar, stark similarities to, to the talk this morning, where it was really just hard work, persistence, good connections with people that can help. Um, so I think that theme throughout, you know, for those that are willing to do the world's tallest mass timber building or create a product that doesn't currently exist in a market, um, I think really feeds into, you know, how we're gonna continue to see this, this industry grow. So this is the project under construction from a couple months ago. And then I think this is my, my last slide here. This is a project, a little, again, closer to home, seven stories of mass timber construction. Uh, this is like, I don't know, the trifecta or the quadfecta, um, affordable housing, passive house, mass timber construction, um, where this developer is, is really just kind of taking it all to the next level. Um, really beautiful project. It's, it's under construction now, should be complete here in another couple of months. Um, and they're already, this same developer contractor team is already looking at doing several other projects like this right in Boston. So, um, yes? Why is 
are the uh, elevator shafts concrete there? Is that just a choice or is that? For that tall one? This one here? The one, yeah, I can't, you're standing in front of Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the ascent, yep. Yeah, um, a couple reasons. Number one was that, so this project, like I showed the three new construction types in the building code, and this project goes way beyond even what those allow. So this project had to get a very project specific building approval from the fire official in Milwaukee. And one of the things that, that was required is that you have non-combustible egress cores or shafts. So it was, it was in, in a sense a concession to just satisfying the building official. If he's gonna let them build a building this large, he wanted those elements to be non-combustible. Um, additionally though, if you, even if this project were permitted under the code, the code actually does say once you get above 12 stories, then the egress shafts do have to be non-combustible. So there's a few different reasons there. And maybe the 13th thing to mention is that those cores are providing the building's lateral resistance. They're acting as shear walls. And there isn't current code recognition of mass timber systems essentially above six or seven stories um, to resist specifically seismic loads in, in high seismic country. Yeah, I saw a really fascinating webinar. I think it was by Woodworks on this the same mm -hmm. project. Is that available for people to watch? I think they find it fascinating. Yeah, for sure. We have um, we have a, a a website that we contribute to called the Wood Institute. It's kind of where we host a lot of a lot of our recorded education, um, and it's it is up there. It's free. I think you have to create a free um, login, but it's up there for free. Yeah. All right. So next. Yes, sir. So uh, another product that I saw on a house building project uh, that I was visiting is a, a laminated, like a plywood product, but it's two inches thick and cut into basically a what you call a two by 20 and like maybe 24 or 28 feet long. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're talking about is gluing up solid wood for what we're calling mass timber. What do you call that, and how does that fit into your presentation? I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. I know the particular project or product you're talking about, but if it sounds it's like LVL. it's LSL or LVL, is LVL. what I was kind of thinking. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we would consider it a mass timber product. As I mentioned, mass timber is an umbrella term. Kind of right. everybody has a slightly different definition of it. Well, these are thin laminates, like plywood. Yeah, and there's a manufacturer in, in Oregon um, called Ferreris Lumber. They, they used to be, they still are a, a, a plywood manufacturer. They've started creating a product that they call mass plywood panels. It's a bit of a misnomer in the sense that they're not just taking plywood technology and scaling it up, but they're creating structural composite lumber similar to LVL and then one inch thick billets and then they can glue six of those billets together. So they're making like six inch thick uh, panels. So kind of similar to what you're talking about, maybe just on a slightly bigger scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Charlie now. Is this mic used for sound for the recording or not? This one, do I, can I stand over here or do I have to stand over there? Does it matter where I stand? I got to stand over here. Okay, um, Ricky, I'm just looking at the time with the speakers. I'm gonna go pretty fast because I think we lost some time at the beginning. So Charlie Levesque, I'm president of a 28-year-old consulting firm, Innovative Natural Resource Solutions. We've had our client for 25 years, and that's the hat I have on here as executive director of the Northeast State Forces Association. And those of you from Vermont, that's Mike Snyder, who's actually chair of the board, and his counterparts across the Northeast are part of a little nonprofit. We do a bunch of different things if we can find the money, and this is one that we did. But the impetus behind it is uh, is really coming from Dr. Peggy Clouston. She was really the advocate of the Oliver building at UMass that Ricky pointed out, and a huge advocate for mass timber, and, and well, a wonderful person. Uh, and she's a wood engineering professor there. And in 2019, uh, she has a wood engineering lab at UMass, and they did a bunch of testing on eastern white pine and eastern hemlock for use for mass timber as a starting point. And everything seemed to work out in those tests, but that's, they weren't official tests, and this is really sort of building on that. But more than that, I'm a forester, field forester, still do some field forestry work, and if you're like me, you see a lot of that in the woods in the Northeast. And uh, about five or six years ago, those of you from Maine, there are a few people from Maine here, or Chris, good to see you. So uh, five or six years ago, there were a couple of uh, uh, developers that said they were building 
uh, cross-laminated timber uh, manufacturing plants in, in Maine, two of them. And they haven't broken ground on either, and neither are gonna happen, at, uh, at least the ones that were announced then. But because of that, I got to thinking about the notion of when that happens, and it will happen because Ricky showed you that incredible graph of what's going on, uh, what species are we going to be using? And we have an underutilized species, softwood species because most of it's made out of softwood, and that's eastern hemlock. That's where the ideas came from for this whole thing, and so we'll, we'll walk through it pretty quickly. The outline, a little background, phase one is testing and certification of it because in order to use it commercially, you've got to do that. Phase two is getting some in actual buildings, and Megan's going to follow me, and we're going to be putting some in the building uh, here in a few learnings. This was funded through the Wood Innovations Grant from the USDA Forest Service. You know, Ricky mentioned USDA Forest Service, doing a lot of stuff to, to fund these things, to really encourage it to get to commercialization of some of these things, and this is one of those. So the purpose of the project, threefold. Number one, uh, to get a species that is not currently certified under the ANSI PRG 320 standard for making cross-laminated timber to that point. Secondly, to get some in commercial buildings, we're going to see one of them a little bit later here. And then thirdly, really to pro provide that base when we do get a plant built in the Northeast that will have a, uh, another species group in addition to spruce fir, because that got certified last year and is a likely candidate. We're always already using Pacific uh, kind of coast kind of wet, uh, spruce in uh, mass timber. And so those are really the purposes of the whole thing. And so. Uh, just wanted to, to go back to hemlock inventory. You know, we want to think about sustainability when we talk about using a, a new species. I think it's highly underutilized. All the forest is in here know that. But uh, in Vermont, there's about 28 million board feet of hemlock sawlogs cut each year. And we have annual net growth of about 84 million board feet. So the point is, we don't utilize a whole lot of a uh, uh, high percentage of the growth. We have huge standing inventories. In fact, in Vermont, uh, hemlock is the third most abundant species. Most people here probably didn't realize that, few of you do, behind sugar maple and red maple. So there's a lot of it here, and for this species, the growth uh, to harvest ratio is three to one, which means that we're growing three times what we harvest or remove each year. So we've got some good numbers associated uh, with that uh, for this species. Here's kind of where, where hemlock grows, the darker uh, colors are where it grows more densely, but it's everywhere. And in the northeastern states, it's in the top five in all the northeastern states, right? So it's an abundant species, and, and those of us who work in the woods kind of know that. Inventories are going in the right direction over time. This is from 2004 to, to present in Vermont. Inventories of hemlock are increasing, and this is just saw log inventory. And then the net uh, growth versus removal, right? So green, this is what grows. That's all we take each year, right? So those sustainability numbers look, look really good in terms of a new species. And this is just looking at the surrounding states. Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and New York in terms of standing hemlock inventory, right? So there's a lot of it here. So uh, hence the, the, the purpose of it. And Ricky went through mass timbers. So I don't have to start you off on that, but we'll talk, talk first a little bit about the phase one. A little piece of block that I keep in my truck all the time to show people uh, hemlock, but nobody's ever done this before with the species, so it was a, a, an interesting project from the begin, beginning and one of the most interesting I've worked on. So uh, the phase one stuff is to get this stuff certified and tested. What that means is making CLT and breaking it in the lab. That's what that means. And that's what we did in this test. We actually finished it about a month and a half ago. Uh, in the first phase, Sersosimo lumber out of their Brattleboro mill was the key mill that did um, the drying and also the, the finishing of the material. And they also saw it some in the first phase, but we also got some lumber from Parker Lumber in Bradford, Maine in the first phase as well uh, for the stock. It's two by six stock that we use, and the, the uh, drying spec is 12 to 15 percent moisture content. And the kilns at Sersosimo, a mill that's been around for a long, long time, they've never, ever dried hemlock before this project. So very <laughs> little hemlock gets dried, so it's a new use for the species. Um, and that part of it alone was a learning curve for a lot of folks involved. This is in their kilns. After it was dried, went through their planer mill, uh, and ultimately uh, planed to the final dimensions. Uh, that is the feedstock for this, which is one and a half by five and a and a half inches, that's a two by six. That's the finished dimensions that goes into the CLT plant. I don't know what I'm doing here, but something, something's. So the grading process is critical because hemlock is rarely graded. 
and there has to be official grading, and to use it for this, each board has to be grade stamped. We don't do that with the species. So again, breaking new ground in the supply chain, and that's what, what happened uh, in the first part of it. They actually did that yesterday at Sosmo for our second phase, and so we're, we're in good shape. But what we're looking for is that moisture content and making grade two or better. Uh, for CLT for the longitudinal and grade three for the transverse or the short dimension. And so there's two grade stamps. I bet nobody in here has ever seen a hemlock grade stamp because I know I haven't. You have? Good for you. It's rarely done. It's rarely done. And the Nelma graders uh, graded this stuff. And I was there when they did this stuff. And it's really beautiful material when it gets dried and plain. We don't see hemlock that way. We see it in rough timbers. Uh, but it's wonderful stuff. Packaged sent on trucks, and then it had to go down to the manufacturing plant, which is in Alabama. And so this is the smart lamb plant in uh, Dothan, Alabama. I had uh, the opportunity with Andy Fass, who's the forest industry specialist uh, in New Hampshire, to be there for three days when they manufactured it for that first phase. Uh, a lot of what they do is breaking it and testing the characteristics. So in the plant, they, uh, they need to, needed to do the finger joining part, which I didn't realize how important, but you see these, this is an actual hemlock panel that they made, right? It's got a long dimension and then a transverse or a short dimension. Uh, the long dimension can be as much as 50 feet long. More of them are in that 20 to 30 foot range ultimately, but we don't grow timber that long, right? So they gotta glue them together in a finger jointed fashion, and that finger jointing characteristic is a really important part of the certification. Again, stuff I learned, I'm not an engineer, but I learned a lot when we were there. So they spent a bunch of time doing that. Here's the long stuff you can see after the finger joint. This stuff is like 30 feet long, right? Going through a, a planer for a final uh, adjustment. And then the short dimension is that transverse, which is eight or 10 feet, right? So this is how it gets put together to plant. I'm not gonna talk about it, but these are, Huge suction machines that pick up boards that are not glued together yet and put them together, run the glue on them to, to, to put the layers through. And the final product looks like this before it's all cut up on the ends. The ends are all rough, right? This is actually our eastern hemlock that came out for our testing. Uh, went on a truck and then went to Tacoma, Washington to the APA testing lab was to, in order to do it. So you saw those panels that I showed you in, in the previous one, right? They all got cut up at the machine, uh, in, in the CNC machine in Alabama to make it into smaller billets, right? And the purpose for which is to break every one of those and to measure all the characteristics around that, which they did broke all the pieces and they have different machines that break them and measure all the, all the, because they need to know the strength characteristics to make sure that they make the PRG 320 grade. Ultimately, a report comes out. This is a public report. This was funded by USDA. Anybody interested in the report, I'll give it to you, uh, that shows that it meets the grade for uh, the requirement of P PRG 320. So phase two, which we're in right now, and yesterday at Sersosimo Lumber, they finished the planning uh, job on all the lumber for phase two that are gonna go into two buildings, and it's ready and packaged, to, ready to go to Alabama for the, for the actual uh, manufacturer a little bit later this summer. In the phase two, White Mountain Lumber produced most of the hemlock lumber that's in Berlin, New Hampshire from timber that came from New Hampshire and Vermont primarily, and a little bit from the University of New Hampshire sawmill as well. Uh, Sersosimo Lumber and Bradwell did all the drying and also all the finishing uh, of the lumber, getting it ready to go to the CLT plant. So one building in Boston, it will go in ultimately, and it will be mixed with other species CLT because we actually just don't have enough of hemlock for the whole building. Uh, and then what you're gonna hear about next is the Fairbanks Museum in St. Johnsbury, uh, Vermont. Megan's gonna be talking about much more about that and how that fits into that building. So, Ricky, I think this is your map, right? Can I steal this from you? Uh, could be. Maybe. Anyway, um, the blue ones are planned and this one is no longer planned, but the black ones I think are still the CLT plants in the United States. And you can see that for the Northeast, where of course we have the most dense forest in, in the whole country, the nearest plant is Sterling Lumber. And up until now, Sterling Lumber, and that's in Chicago, all they've made is uh, timber mats in CLT. You probably didn't even know that, Ron. He would make timber mats by putting threaded rods with big right. uh, mass timber you know, structural beams. Uh, there, they've made, been making them for a long, long time. They are now trying to get into the construction market 
to the structural CLT market, and they probably will. But when, after that, the nearest plant is in Alabama, and that's why we work with them on this project. Unbelievable, right, for, for a region like this not to have one of these plants. So hopefully, ultimately, we get there. So a few, few uh, learnings here. Um, the supply chain for hemlock is very different than spruce fir and other species. Many of you in the room know that. We figured that out big time. There are no big hemlock mills out there for sawmills. They're all, and we have many hemlock mills, but they're all very small. So getting any kind of volume together is going to be a challenge as the industry grows here. I'm not saying it couldn't be done, but it will be a challenge. And especially the dry, drying, planting, and grading is rarely done for this species. So we had to kind of develop that supply chain just to do the project. Uh, what we did learn is that, and, and we were hoping, is that eastern hemlock price-wise is very competitive with spruce, spruce fir. And we're going to say in our report that uh, the cost of eastern hemlock was four or five hundred dollars less expensive per thousand board foot in the inf input phase. Because that's what we found at the time that we, that we did the purchases, it has a huge advantage over spruce fir. Will it when the time comes for a plant? We don't know, right? Because plant prices are all over the place. But those of us who work it with hemlock in the woods, this is logical up to us that it would be less expensive than spruce fir. Hopefully it will be over time. Uh, the number two grade issue, how much out of uh, hemlock do you, can you get that grade? Not too bad. We only lost 12 to 15 percent out of the saw runs uh, that didn't quite make uh, the number two grade. The good thing is that in the run we did yesterday, uh, we're also getting number three grade. Because you remember what Ricky said, the interior plies can use this lower grade. And so the yield yesterday was actually better than the first time because we didn't grade three, uh, grade it uh, the first time around. So uh, the, ultimately what the testing shows, there's a standard, and this species has met that standard. However, uh, for the engineers, if there are any in the room, you're going to find out, and I, we would have guessed it, and Peggy Clouston at UMass already knew this, that it's not as strong as spruce fir or southern yellow pine, two of the competing species. That doesn't mean it can't be used. It simply means that the engineers need to look at that when they're figuring out what they're going to do with it uh, in their buildings. A um, little challenging to work with architects, builders, and developers when it comes to uh, you know, including a new species. There are a number of engineers I've talked to, not with your team, Megan, but with uh, other folks uh, who were very skeptical of using a new species, and you can understand why. But obviously, like anything uh, that's new that's going to be adopted, uh, it, it, we need some time to work through things. Uh, but there's plenty of opportunity with this, this new species, especially for more reasonable spans, like 20 feet. There's not going to be any issues with hemlock around that, so there's going to be lots of applications that hemlock will be able to be used for. And because we went down to uh, the Dothan, Alabama plant in January, I found out it's a really good place to be. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. And time is erasing, so I'm going to turn it over to whoever's next, Ricky. Uh, questions now, if we want to do it, or are you going to do it at the end? Sure. Okay. Chris, okay. just a quick clarification on the report. It said hemlock and tamarack. Yeah, so um, when when they do this PRG testing, and, and Ricky can probably tell you more about it than I can, they use a species group. And there are a couple of alternatives. That this is the one that it fit best, but there's no tamarack in the test itself. It's just, a, a, Ricky, where does it come? It comes from standard engineering tables. They just group species of, yeah. of timber in, and that, that happens to be uh, the one that so goes So it doesn't in. mean that tamarack's also approved, does it? Well, it actually does, but we didn't <laughs> test any tamarack. <laughs> we didn't, I mean, it's, it's not that much of it. It's not ubiquitous like tamarack is, so it's not likely going to be used for that purpose. Yeah, in the back. Just real quick, you mentioned spruce fir is stronger. Does that include uh, balsam fir and red spruce? Yes. Yeah, like because it. those are all in those categories. Okay. Yeah. Again, they all meet the, the standard, but when, when the engineers actually look at the design tables that show the actual strength, you're going to see that they're more. And we already knew that going into this because of the testing at UMass. How much, how many questions do you want to take? Want to move on? Let's or? move on to Megan. We'll come back to questions okay. at the end. Hi, uh, my name is Megan Nizinski. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay. Uh, if my voice starts to tail off, throw your hands up or throw something at me. Um, I'm a project architect with Vermont Integrated Architecture. Uh, real quick, a little bit about me. I'm a Rust Belt kid, and I grew up in a timber town. And so for me, I mean, I saw in the landscape the scars of oil, coal, gas, and I really appreciated and kind of understood uh, what the timber industry 
uh, was doing in our region. And so from a really early age, um, I knew that I wanted to pursue a career in architecture. And so I've been working since 2008 to try to get a mass timber building. So this has taken quite a while. <laughs> I've been working with Fairbanks Museum now for um, about three years uh, on this project. Uh, so really exciting uh, to be here and have learned a ton. Through the course of this project um, and what I share here, I've got a couple questions for you. And if we don't have uh, time here, I would love to chat with you after because I'm learning a ton by being tied into this industry and what you all know about your product. So I'd appreciate to, to connect on that. So many of you probably know the Fairbanks Museum um, located in St. Johnsbury. It was founded in 1889. It is a precious gem of not only the St. Johnsbury community, the Northeast Kingdom, but our state and our region. Um, it is a heavy masonry building. The walls are about two feet thick of red sandstone, and it has a heavy timber um, roof structure. It's amazing. Um, get a behind the scenes tour sometime. If you can get up into the attic underneath that uh, wood barrel vault, there's this beautiful uh, heavy timber uh, truss system up there. Uh, the building is, is listed on the National Historic uh, Register. This project is also a collaboration of a variety of partners. Uh, so Charlie's Innovation Grant, the USDA Rural Development, we are the recipients of a two and a half million dollar federal appropriation through Welch's office. Uh, we're also working with the Save America's Treasures Grant through the National Park Service that is with the Department of Interior. Did I already say USDA Rural Development? Yeah. Northern Borders, Northern Region. Orders. 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 <laughs> I'm like, I have all the acronyms in my head. Um, I hate to list those because I'm sure I missed someone. Um, but lots of partners, um, lots of great input, and a variety of different angles on the project. So if you've never been to the Fairbanks Museum, please go. It is an amazing place. Um, so from the exhibits in there, of course, are fantastic. A shameless plug for them right now. There is a mass timber exhibit right uh, in the museum, so please go and check that out. Uh, we are breaking ground on this project in 10 days, uh, so you'll be able to kind of peek through uh, in the backyard to kind of see that. Um, but the other things, if you're a architecture geek like me, um, you know, the use of wood throughout this building. So the species in this main uh, space are predominantly uh, cherry and oak, and so that kind of plays into some of the species that we selected uh, for the new part and how we're trying to speak to that. Some of the main goals of the addition um, were to create hands-on exhibit space uh, for children, uh, demonstration space that they could actively learn, um, Increased accessibility. Uh, the second, the balcony level here is fully inaccessible, and so we wanted to be able to like extend that and make it more accessible to all. Uh, so it does have an elevator. I'd love to chat with somebody. We do have a wood frame elevator here. It's not ma not mass timber. I'd love to chat with you all about how we can help advance that in the code because wood frame elevator shafts in the state of Vermont are extremely challenging uh, to achieve from a code perspective. Um, and another thing, uh, with the Fairbanks Museum, we know that we get our weather from there. The second oldest operating um, weather station in the country is located in the backyard of the museum. So that was the main driver for the geometry of this edition. We had to have setbacks. We didn't interfere or affect your weather predicting. Um, and so that also actually played into the uh, structural design because that was driving the layout of it. Um, so in the very first conversation, the very first time that I met Adam Kane, the executive director of the Fairbanks Museum, I was sitting at the picnic table in the backyard of the museum, and I asked him to tell me a little bit about his vision for the project, the museum's vision for this project, what they were after. So he went into you know, the mission of the museum to inspire wonder and curiosity, um, that it was a natural science museum, a history museum, that was a big part of this what the Northeast Kingdom meant to him, what this community means to him and to the museum. And it was a big opportunity for regional workforce development. Um, so he talked to me also about environmental stewardship and these things, and I said, have you ever thought of mass timber? He was like, funny you should say that. I think you had just talked to him. Um, he was like, I was talking to this other person, and I think you talked to Ricky. He was like, people are all talking about this mass timber thing. Tell me what you know about it, or uh, why you want to do it. Um, 
So I shared with him my story about trying to get a mass timber building and where I came from and why I believe that our buildings can be our carbon sink for the future. So getting, uh, minimizing the carbon and steel I think is key to our climate solution. Uh, so as we started to get into the design, um, we were really gravitating towards nail laminated timber. And so it's essentially, you can think of it as floor framing that has inch and a half uh, centers. Uh, so you're nailing it together. And the idea was if we as a design team could work with Ricky and could work with our structural engineer to basically come up with that nailing pattern. And if we could provide that to anybody, any of our builders who are here in the region, they could do this in their shop. They could lay up some of these, you know, two foot wide pieces. They could bring them to the site and do that. Um, so that was our main driver for going for NLT. We knew that there wasn't a plant in the region, and we were really trying to avoid shipping from somewhere else. We wanted to use local lumber. Uh, the pandemic didn't really do us any favors here with workforce shortages and things like that, but Charlie did. Um, so um, we'll get to this CLT switch um, in a little bit, but we started with the Mass Timber. Um, we've been to the museum. Uh, we've probably experienced the really low balcony. Uh, so the floor to floor height in the museum is shown here. So this is fairly typical heights for residents. This is pretty challenging for a commercial building. So when you're trying to get structure and mechanical systems and museums, they like to change the lighting every time they change an exhibit. And then we now have Wi-Fi, and all sorts of other um, devices and securities and camera and all of that. So there's not a whole lot of sandwich there to work with. So I knew I was going for a very thin structural system, but again, we were trying to avoid steel and concrete. So um, the mass timber helped us in that, but it meant that we needed to look for another place to put those services. Um, another thing for us, we found through some soils investigations, uh, we have sizing soils at the Fairbanks Museum. This course, so that means that our new building and our masonry building need to be able to move separately in the event of a seismic event. So that was one consideration. The other was with um, this being on the National Historic Register and being such a precious building, historic preservation really wanted us to be intentional about where and how we would touch the building and where we would fasten to it. So they really wanted us to hold off as much as we could and just touch it very lightly. So we came up with this idea of sort of holding back our structure. The existing museum, the face of it is also very irregular, which is nearly impossible to touch. So we left a gap and we were able to easily cantilever, uh, which was easily done with the mass timber. Um, so for sourcing the wood, this was a challenge early on. Uh, typically, uh, and this is one of these things that I'd like your help with. Um, our specifications were prioritizing sustainability, and so we're often writing in things like it should be F thou will provide FSC provided lumber. And as we started to think about it, it was like, could anybody in Vermont, can any of our mills provide this to me? And so I reached out to Christine. Christine put me in touch with a few different regulators. She also put me in touch with a few different uh, mill operators, and I asked them, what are you doing? What is the difference between FSC? Tell me about SFI, ATFS. I know a little bit about this. I spent some time in the wood science department at WVU, so I know enough to be dangerous. I know enough to ask the question that I don't actually know. So I started to get into, in Vermont and in our region, what are some of these standards and protections that are in place, and how can I put that in? So we gave the either or in our spec, I don't think this is perfect language. I would love to discuss that with every one of you and help me pick it apart and let's rewrite it because uh, we'd like to include, improve this and uh, take it on to our future projects. Um, so then along came Charlie. <laughs> and so we, the, our timing uh, now lined up. We had a failed bid project or failed bid process. We had a number of uh, a number of pandemic uh, related challenges and so we have experienced a number of delays. Those delays in the end ended up being somewhat of a blessing and so we are timing now lined up with Charlie's project. So uh, we will be the recipient of um, there's Hemlock, Hemlock CLT um, which is really exciting. So you're getting the wood from his testing situation? Yes. 
Nice. So that was a Yahoo, and then it was kind of a, oh, we have to redesign it for NLT, CLT, and the drawings are all done and everything. But in general, the NLT was actually uh, more limiting, we found, and so with the CLT, you know, these were the three main uh, differences that we had to adjust for. So it was bi-directional, so with the NLT, we had to really pay attention to, like, where the toilet stacks were going through and where we were penetrating for anything like that. Um, it got a lot easier in CLT, but we had already done that design work, so we didn't go back and undo it. It was already in there. Um, higher shear capacity. So with the NLT, we were putting an extra layer of sheathing on top to tie those panels together. Uh, by moving to CLT, we were left able to eliminate uh, that sheathing, which saved labor, saved material cost, and we picked up a half inch. <laughs> um, and then our dimensions between uh, the five ply CLT, we were using eight inch NLT, we picked up another three eighths of an inch. Uh, so overall we got seven eighths of an inch, which uh, you'd be surprised that actually did help in a few places. It meant we didn't have to do custom doors to get under certain beams. Uh, so that did help, but it was more the issue of having to chase it all the way through the project because we were done. Um, but well worth it to be able to participate. So really quickly, I'm just going to hit a couple high-level points about the building and the project itself. Um, there is a model um, of the project that is in the museum, and if you go and visit it, I would, I would just say take a look at the base. Uh, the base we actually, uh, our team and our office flew up, and so it is a mass timber itself, and then we tooled it to become the topography of the site itself. So. It's kind of cool. Um, so the addition, it's very small. So it's a 6,500 square foot addition. It is fully accessible. It's on three levels. It will have an accessible uh, roof deck. It is high performance. A key goal here was for us to decarbonize our material choices. So we're trying to minimize foam. We unfortunately do not have wood fiber insulation. That was early on in the project, but we couldn't get it. The numbers didn't pencil out. Our timing doesn't align with uh, Timber HP, unfortunately, but hopefully soon. Um, and we also did adjust our concrete and our drywall mixes so they're lower, car lower carbon content. Um, lots of historic preservation um, details. I'm just gonna, uh, so we're trying to also, on the exterior, highlight stone and local stones. So we have Vermont slate, and then throughout the landscape, there'll be specimen of granite and marble and different things as benches. Um, again, continuing that kind of uh, educational piece. So, I alluded to this before. In the main museum, uh, it's predominantly cherry and oak uh, used in the cabinets and the finishes there. Um, in this addition, what we were trying to do is we wanted to make a nod back to the historic building, but it was very important uh, to us and also to historic preservation that this building be of its time and sort of creating the new history but have a nod back to the old. So we wanted to highlight a variety of different species of wood throughout the building, but we opted for this to be sort of very light because of our low um, head height for it to be light wander woods, pulling all that together so you have this sort of light, new, more contemporary, and then the older, more honey uh, species um, in the old museum. So it is a geothermal building. It is a high performance energy system. Tracking those systems through there is a challenge. This is our uh, CLT that will be exposed. We used a double beam system so that we could um, hide some of our electrical and raceways in there and also tucked up behind. Um, and then we do have an exhibit console along there and that's essentially where the ductwork is going with that sort of a shelf that uh, the children can be able to. Um, but we had some limitations there with only like eight feet to work with. Um, I've already hit kind of the structural systems here, with the exception of the steel. So we do have uh, steel connectors, we do have steel braces. That's really driven by the geometry that we had and needing to pick up some lateral bracing just because it's a wide open floor plan. We didn't have much opportunity for uh, shear walls, so we had to go to a hybrid system. We mobilize in 10 days and we anticipate uh, completion in May of 2023.
talking about the uh, Adam Out of Expansion job, which is a mass timber project down in uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire. I'm JTM, and I'm a project manager with Rear Company. I'm the general contractor on the project. Um, and I have two members here from the Benson Wood team, uh, with the uh, mass timber fabricators, uh, installers, and designers that will introduce themselves when they get started. A uh, quick overview of the job. Um, it's a three-story addition, about 29,000 square foot. Um, it's primarily a uh, new laboratory space with some additional office and conference rooms, too, in the top floor. Uh, we do have a rooftop a mechanical platform uh, for the new mechanical equipment. Um, and then part of the renovation is a pretty extensive MEP renovation, new mechanical equipment on the current building, as is that all feeds this addition. Um, currently, uh, the project is in construction. Uh, we actually had an early mobilization this past fall uh, to get a jump start on some of the site clearing and setting up ENS control. Um, our main mobilization was here in April, and currently we're about 80% done with foundations uh, and the basement walls. Uh, slab pour is scheduled here for the uh, end of the month, and timber will be commencing here early August. And our overall completion date is scheduled here for end of October of next year. So, like most jobs, um, we do have a lot of job site constraints. Um, you can kind of see the new addition here is wedged in between uh, an active building that has over 100 people on any given day. Uh, we have a detention pond that we are reconfiguring yet have to keep active during the whole job. And then our wetlands um, surround the rest of the site. Um, that we have restricted access to um, other than putting in a pedestrian bridge from the new parking lot to the addition and a little bit of uh, under uh, storm drainage. Um, coming from a general contractor's perspective, uh, there are some pre-construction considerations and challenges with timber that you just need to be aware of. Um, the first thing that kind of got our attention was just the builder's risk policy. Um, as a general contractor, it's pretty typical you carry this. Um, but when we reached out to all our uh, typical agencies, our initial cost came in about three times of what you would consider a standard construction project. Um, obviously, the owner wasn't too happy about this, so kind of working with them, uh, we were actually able to uh, get them to carry a rider on their current policy. Um, that kind of brought the price back into a range. Um, we also had an extended permit review um, from the time of submission to the time we achieved our permit, it took about four months. Um, I'm not 100% sure whether this was directly related to the mass timber or just the city of Lebanon being a little bit behind uh, and stacked up, but either way, it's definitely something you have to consider. Um, and then the biggest thing uh, as a general contractor is just the overall protection of the timber itself. Um, as you guys probably all know, moisture and wood are generally not a good thing. Um, and then also the added factor is most of this mass timber is a finished product. Um, the seal in the bottom of the CLT floors are the ceilings, the sheer walls, the glue and beams. Um, so a big part of uh, my job and uh, as a general contractor is to prevent uh, moisture from setting on uh, the structure. Um, a couple ways we're achieving this is, you know, one, we're installing a temporary roof on each floor deck. Um, so as we install the CLT, we'll throw an ice and water shield on it, leave it there. Um, and then kind of just go up in the next level. Um, we have a unique feature, our restraint on this job too, is we actually have to preload our floor decks before we can install our exterior framing, uh, which means we have to come in, pour our topping slab, and then once we're done with that, we can come back to our exterior framing. Obviously, this leaves the building exposed to the elements for a couple more months than one would like. Um, so we have a current plan to actually go through and install temporary walls around the whole perimeter to help protection uh, from weather. Um, we'll be installing column wraps around all the glue lamp columns. Um, I would like to say this wasn't necessarily protection from the weather elements, but more protection from the uh, contractor elements. So, you know, those loose uh, tool, uh, tool chests and um, lifts going around the site, the uh, last thing we want to do is, you know, have to be repairing a, a finished product. Um, and one thing to consider too is just the project schedule and the timeline. Um, we were actually initially supposed to start the addition back in October. Um, this would have put the CLT and timber starting in December. 
not necessarily the best time of year. Um, so as a team, uh, we actually pushed the addition to a start in April, uh, which now pushes the CLT starting back in October, I mean, in August, a lot more favorable time of the year. Um, and the last biggest challenge is just general education of the engineers and subcontractors. Obviously a new system here, um, most of the guys are still thinking when they see timber, oh, it's two by four, two by six framing. Um, they don't understand the concept of, of, of what it is. Um, simple thing here is just the general MEP coordination we had to go through. Um, so the red lines show our main interior CLT shear wall. Um, and this was the initial mechanical design. So you could see all these green bubbles were where our engineer wanted us to penetrate the CLT wall with ductwork. Structural engineer wasn't too happy about this. Um, so we, we had a, a lot of pre-planning um, involving our mechanical uh, engineer, mechanical contractors, and our structural engineer. Uh, through that, we were kind of able to reroute um, a lot of this ductwork, find a couple key situations where we could penetrate the CLT um, that wasn't actually a, a structural member, primarily above the, uh, the doorways into the rooms, kind of right here and over the other corner. Um, and then there's been some conversations on CLT shaft. So we actually have a CLT elevator shaft. Um, the one thing to get that with elevator contractors, is anyone that's worked in them are pretty uh, stubborn in their ways. And um, they kept telling us that we had to recess all their inserts for the rails and the panels. Um, they, they couldn't understand the concept that like, hey, you know, this is a wood product, it's not your typical um, CMU shaft wall. So uh, I had to kind of work with them, get them to understand that, hey, we're just doing a surface mounted product here. Um, and then one thing we had to consider too is your, your general opening size to get the elevator equipment in. Um, generally, you know, with a CMU wall, you leave that opening up, you come back, tooth it in afterwards. Um, but the initial design of our panels didn't allow for an opening large enough to actually get the elevator equipment in. Um, so we actually had to change a couple locations into a, a load-bearing stud wall so that we could frame it in uh, afterwards. But um, So those are some of the things as a general contractor with reconstruction you got to worry about. Um, hopefully next year I can tell you this has always worked perfectly to plan and you know uh, we'll go from there. But now I think Florin's going to jump in here and talk a little bit more about the timber side. Um, My name is uh, Florian. I work for uh, Bensonwood um, as a structural engineer. Uh, but on this particular project, I didn't actually do the, uh, the structural engineering. I just helped uh, build a model of what the outside engineer put on drawings. Um, so they basically send us a big stack of drawings uh, showing all the details and the specifications. and. Um, and then we built a, a 3D model, which you can see here, with all the connections, all the screws, all the fasteners, everything's in there. Um, and then from there, it goes to our machines. So this is the, uh, this is the timber frame. Um, those are 44,000 board feet, uh, just uh, columns and beams. Uh, the columns are Three feet, nine and a half by nine and a half, and then the beams are the same width and the depth ranges from thirteen and a half to thirty-eight inches deep. We used um, Nordic Lem on this project. Uh, it comes out of uh, Quebec, and um, it's all black spruce. Uh, that's the only species they use. Um, it's it comes from a place way up in Quebec. Uh, I think it's like a seven, eight hour drive north of the city of Quebec. Um, and the trees are not very big up there, but it doesn't really matter because they just glue it up to whatever size um, it's needed. Uh, they don't really use two by material, um, probably because they're in Canada and they don't uh, <laughs> use inches. Uh, so you can see that's about what it looks like. Um, yeah, they're pretty small trees, and then they just glue it up uh, for the for the glue lamps. The CLT is a little different. Um, this is the scope of the CLT. Um, all the three floors are um, a CLT, and then there's a couple of walls. This is the elevator shaft here. 
it has two walls, um, CLT, and then the other two are going to be the infills um, that they're going to put in later. Uh, this in the background is a triangle. With, uh, this free side uh, is the is the stair shaft. Um, those are relatively small. So they're only three plies, I believe, um, four and eight, and then five and five eighths. Um, and the same is true for this for this interior core. Uh, those are all shear walls. Um, the floors are thicker there, six and seven eighths. And I have this another it's another two hundred twenty thousand board feet. Um, people were talking about carbon sequestration earlier. Uh, this is the perfect opportunity. Uh, there's lots of wood going into those buildings. Um, a little more about the CLT. Uh, they come in three, five, seven, or nine layers. Uh, Nordic specifically can make slabs from our eight feet, eight foot width to sixty-four foot length. It's usually not practical because it's really hard to handle. Um, but if it's ever needed, they can they can do those kind of length. Um, this was already mentioned earlier, like. You know, you put high strength material on the outer layers, um, and and then low strength material on the inside because it doesn't really matter all that much. Uh, another great wrench is the two-way span, um, so it can do cantilevers in, in both directions. Uh, one direction is significantly stronger than the other, uh, so the so the main direction, um, which would be this this direction, is much stronger uh, because they they use high grade material. But then also, you have more structural depth, um, which makes a huge difference. Um, so if, if it's spanning in the other direction, in the weaker direction, you only get this structural depth instead of that, and that the material is low grade. So there's a factor of six to eight uh, in, in, the, in the capacity of the span between the two directions. A huge, huge advantage um, over something like NLT or GLT um, or dowel laminated timber is that it's dimensionally stable uh, because the grain runs in both directions and it's all glued up. Uh, so it, it doesn't really move. It only moves in the thickness if it ever shrinks or swells. Um, that's another great advantage. You don't have to um, account for uh, gaps and stuff so if the material ever moves. The connections um, between the columns and the beams, we mostly used these Rikon hangers. Uh, they're concealed connectors. Uh, they're really great if there's um, if there's any concern with uh, fire resistance, which was not the case in this uh, for this project. Uh, but because they're all concealed inside uh, the wood, um, you don't have to worry about uh, protecting the steel. Um, for fire. Come in all kinds of sizes, you use tons of screws. Um, what you're seeing here is like a reduced capacity. If you want that hanger to work at the full capacity, you need to put screws in almost all of these holes. <laughs> which, uh, which we did. Which we did. <laughs> uh, the, the good thing is uh, that is, it's all done in the shop. So we, we get those beams uh, from Canada and Paul is going to talk a little more about this, and then all these hangers are installed in the shop, and all the screws are in there. And then on site, it looks like this. Um, this is a picture from the internet, uh, but it shows almost exactly what we're doing. Uh, so the the hangers are recessed into the columns, um, not like here. Here, the recess into the beams it can go either way, um, and then and then the columns are are cut back. For the next column to land on top, um, I think those sizes are also about what it's going to be like. Uh, this is from our 3D model. Um, so first, uh, the the beam and the column uh, go up, and they're connected either on the ground and then raised together, or one up to the other. Uh, and then the the CLT floor panel comes in. In this case, there's a joint right at the column. Doesn't have to be like that. It's not always like that. Uh, then the other one comes in. Then there's a spline. In this case, 
it's a strip of OSB. It's nailed off uh, to the CLT panel. And then there's this little standoff for the column, and then the next column goes on top. The other uh, connection that we, uh, that we use for the, for the beams and the columns are these custom welded hangers. Uh, so those right cone connectors, they only go to a certain capacity. Uh, you can put them side by side, which we also did. Um, but there's still limitations. Sometimes the load was so high that they, they just would not work. Um, and then we use these custom welded hangers. Uh, we have them uh, fabricated by a local steel fabricator. And then I can't remember. Those are installed on site, right? We did not attach them to the right. column. Yeah, so they, uh, it would be attached to a column on site, and then the beam drops in, and then there's pins to fasten them. I just want to say that the steel wasn't our choice. We would much rather be using all wood construction, all wood joinery. One of, one of the reasons, uh, I'm Paul, I'm the timber frame head of operations at Benson's, and we, we cut all of the structural beams for this one, not the CLTs. So the CLTs don't make a lot of sense to ship to our facility, recut them there, and then send them to the site. So a lot of times when we're doing these projects, we're asking Nordic, who have a big uh, a router that can handle a huge panel like that. We have them pre-cut that material for us. It gets delivered directly to the site, and we don't have to worry about it. We, it is fully modeled the same way as you saw it in our model here. So we get a shot at all of the detailing. We're pretty sure we like the way it's going to go. We also are really particular about the order of of arrival on site. So in the model, each panel has a number. That number corresponds to what truck it's on and what phase of the, the, the product or what phase of the direction it'll come in on. So so this is this is one of the machines we have in our shop. This is a CNC timber cutting machine built by Hundiger. It's called their robot drive. This is a five axis router functionally. Um, it can handle a 12 inch deep beam, four feet wide. It'll go up to 48 feet. We found out we can actually do 60 feet if we cut a hole in the building. <laughs> <laughs> that, that pretty much happened day one when we got the machine. So. Um, um, so we, we export what you saw were the, the model. From the model, we can export directly to a, to make a CNC file. So you can see the operator that's uh, looking at the file on the machine. And there's a, a big phase for us is that what we call virtual fabrication. So we're actually taking that model information, exporting it to a machine file, and then there's a, a kind of an important checking process that happens because that isn't totally automatic. So we need to be on top of our game, making sure that we're not producing cutting timbers in half or producing too much sawdust. Um, the saw is a 30 millimeter saw, so it can go through 12 inches. It can rip or cross cut. It, uh, it's on a slide, so it slides across the timber. And then we have a 15 tool magazine that's got various drill bits and um, milling cutters in it. We also have a chainsaw station there as well. And then, you know, basically all of our milling and sawing operations happen kind of in that gap. This is our shop. This is the timber print shop. So this, the, the timbers come out on the shop floor. We did all that, the hardware installation, the driving of, of like, I can't even remember how many thousands of screws. I mean, just a ton of screws. <laughs> um, so we have, we have bridge cranes, two-ton bridge cranes. I wish they were bigger. And this was kind of a building that we constructed out of salvage materials that we found around the, the area. One was from a Quonset Hut sort of style building things in Keenan that we repurposed to build our shop. So we, and we, called, uh, so we installed it, we installed the material. We also, what we call tapping, is basically squaring out corners in mortises and, and then we applied the finish. Actually, not in this case because we were going to finish on site. And then this is the way it sits today, waiting for the CLTs to arrive. But so all of, the, everything's wrapped up in bundles. The bundles are all organized so that we know what floor things are going on and, and when they ship. So that's basically in order of trucks right there. 
And one of the things I wanted to mention that you know you were talking about protection of timbers and stuff. The, there is sort of a, that functional difference between NLT or, or DELD and NAID or, and CLT. We've had all kinds of issues with laminated timber that isn't cross-laminated. We've had projects where walls were pushed off the building by an inch and a half. We've had all kinds of problems. So if you are designing with NLT, DLT, any, anything where it's the, all the fibers running in the same direction, you have to be enormously concerned about leaving expansion gaps. Because during construction, these things get wet. And when they get wet, they grow like crazy if it's just a solid piece of wood. So everybody kind of the works wood knows this. You can't ignore that <laughs> when you fill with this stuff. So CLT takes care of it. It does shrink. The shrinkage kind of shows in the little, in the individual pieces, it doesn't get transmitted through the whole panel. So I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you all. We still have five minutes for questions, so <laughs> feel free to ask any of us questions. Go ahead. Um, anybody has ever worked with dry hemlock? It's it, not easy to work with their nail. Is, and, and that's why it's appropriate for CLT. There are no nails in the panels themselves. The hardware gets drilled, you know, this drilling that goes on, the hardware gets attached afterwards. So this is a piece of the raw stock that got cut off. Didn't make the grade because of the black knots. You know, just passing around from yesterday. That's your sauce awesome. and That's how long. What's the, uh, how, 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 what are the characteristics of grade two and grade three hemlock? That's a two-hour presentation, so <laughs> like call the folks shape. at Nelma. You can look. You can look at that stuff. All the stuff is on the national grading standard, and it's available. But it's quite detailed. But those people who were all standing in the line of the photo that I showed you. They were making those decisions like that. I mean, they're experts in doing that to grade it uh, in, in either grade or to dump it out. And so um, this is a specific. So can standard. you do a, like a, a very no. You can't, not enough time. It's so just, detailed. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's a lot to it. So I have a bunch of, and there's several people that are very interested in it. Uh, what's the timeline um, for a mass timber project in terms of getting the material? And is it is it a long waiting period? Is it? It's it's certainly changing because there's more interest. I mean, the supply chain is also growing, but it's it's changing because more and more people are interested. So to give you the short answer. You know, if you talk to any given master manufacturer right now, I think they're going to tell you anywhere, if you went to them today and said, I want master panels on my job site, I think the answer you would get would be anywhere between four and 14 months, let's say. So how does that align with your project? Well, it's, it's best if you can start working with them before you have a completed design. Because then you start integrating with them. I mean, you saw throughout these projects, you're working with the manufacturer to fine tune your design based on what they can do with their press, their CNC equipment. So what, basically what I'm getting at is you're not necessarily going to finish your job design-wise and then wait four to 14 months. You've been working with them during design, so in that time, same time, they're building your production into their schedule. So you may have a month wait or something like that, but it's not that long of a process. Here. Um, you guys in the building end of this, uh, do you see more opportunity for the uh, cross laminated timber or like the LBL type of, um, I, I don't think there's any of that made in the Northeast either. So, well, different, what different, should we build in Vermont? Different purposes. Yeah. yeah, I know the different purposes, but. Uh, they, have, they have different applications. And I think, so the LBL, Jarlam, PSLs, I mean, what's attractive to me about these products is, um, from a carbon standpoint, they're often harvested from smaller trees, and so you know they. My understanding is that the smaller trees are taking up carbon at a faster rate than the larger trees, and that stand can be planted more quickly. No planting. Er, Not in the northeast. Okay. We'll, we'll no, talk, well, this we'll is talk, a, yeah. So I mean, I'm talking like um, I come from sort of mid um, mid Atlantic well, region, and so down there, that that was kind of what we were looking at. So I think that's kind of the interesting from a carbon standpoint that, you know, when we start to look at taking these smaller pieces and putting them together and having bigger pieces, but the LVL, I mean, we're going to use those for, like, 
headers and you know beams and things like that. And they're, but they're not as attractive. Also, like we're not really going to leave them exposed. Yeah, I guess what I would say is kind of what I mentioned in my presentation. It's there's there's many product options and there's not one best solution for every single project. It's use what fits best for a given project. So if it's a header that's not exposed, that may be a great option. If it's an exposed ceiling, that might lead you in a different direction. So it really is just application. Can you, can you say what LVL is? Laminated veneer lumber. And so it's kind of like plywood, but in a beam form. So it's lots of little laminations that are put together. But there's yeah. a kind of like what Rutland Plywood used to make, yeah. but on a bigger scale for construction. I, th I think typically you needed a better quality log or a bigger log to, to make veneer make sense. You know, they used to spin big logs because once you've mounted it, you could turn miles of veneer off of it. I don't think for smaller trees. I have a piece, right. of, I have a piece of LVL at home, and you can see the defects on the surface layer. The log was four inches in diameter. Oh, no. So for that layer. Yeah. I mean, they may, have, they may have started with a lot of right. space. But yeah. I don't know how small they go. But they used to have the near centers that were. Right. Well, and the rest, what's left of it, then they're, they're chipping and they're using that right. for the parallel and then the PSLs and things. Yeah. I'll do one more question before lunch. I, I thought the example of the, the museum is really impressive, um, the old and the new. But I, I think there's also some cool stuff going on with old, like, sub structure or build, building around it have you seen any of that or, or building on top of kind of combining these two like old and new but not necessarily side by side maybe one on top of I, or integrated with we talked to one we, we just did a rooftop addition in brooklyn so it's a full full lvl was it i can't remember not LVL, uh, clt queer combination clt yes. timber but it was so a retrofit glt yeah so a retrofit of a an old building in Brooklyn where it was an, an architect's home. He wanted to add another story on top, so we redid all the floor decks in the building were done with CLT and then added one more story on top of it. Yeah, there's a building in Boston that had a two-story mass timber addition. Building in DC had a three-story vertical addition on top of it, you know, three-story addition. Um, a lot of that is because mass timber is a fairly lightweight material. So you can do multiple stories of addition, but in some cases with no reinforcement of the existing, in some cases with minimal reinforcement of the existing. So it's, it's certainly seeing some use. Uh, we're up against time for lunch, um, but I think you know we can all stick around or talk to people at lunch. But thank you very much for the. Thank you. Thank you.